Scalars. Most students should be familiar with scalars. Scalars are the numbers that we have been using ever since we first learned to add and subtract back in kindergarten. So these are the normal numbers. Unfortunately, in terms of doing physics, we're going to need to do other sorts of mathematics besides just scalar mathematics. Scalars, by definition, are a quantity that is completely expressed by a number and by units. Now it could be that a particular quantity has no units. The coefficient of friction is an example of that. It simply might have a number like 0 0.2. But most things that are described by scalars will have units. Examples of scalar include temperature, volume, mass, or inertia, density, charge, speed, distance, and there are many more in the field of physics that are described by scalar math. One of the important things that students mess up sometimes is they think that scalars always have to be a positive number. That's not true. Scalars may either be positive or they may be negative. They also can be zero. Uh, if you've lived further north than Texas, then you know that the temperature does get below zero in some places like it does in New York where I lived. But just down here we don't tend to have that happen very often. To describe a scalar number, the textbooks have to have some way to describe it so that you know they mean scalar math, not vector math. They do this by just regular type. So if we're going to do something that's a scalar, we'll write something like this. No arrow. Regular type. Most modern textbooks now have a lot more ability in terms of putting descriptive arrows and other things on their symbols. In the old days, if you get an older text, the text will change the type. It'll either use italics or bold or double lined or regular text depending on what they're trying to convey with you because they didn't have computers in those days, just typewriters to type things up. But most modern texts are much easier to read. So if you see something like this, no arrow over the top of it, they're telling you that you must do scalar mathematics with that quantity. <clears throat> now, there's also something called a scalar field, which we won't do very much with this semester, but which we should at least talk about. A scalar field is simply some function that associates at each location of space and time a specific scalar quantity. Now you've probably seen one of those even though you didn't know it. An example of a scalar field is a map during the weather that shows the temperature at various locations. So you know we got thing like this, got Texas down here, Florida, so forth, not planning to draw any type of great thing for thing. And you see things like 75 degrees and it's 82 degrees over here and maybe it's 103 over here and 65 over there. Well at each point there is a specific scalar, in this case a temperature associated with that point and also of course at different days you'll have a different number. So it is a function of both space and time. Alright, so each one of those is a single scalar number. All of them together is called a scalar field. We won't, like I said, deal with scalar fields so much for in this course, but we will deal later on in the second half with vector fields, in particular electric and magnetic fields, as well as gravitational fields, and it would help if you understand what we mean by the concept of a field. All right, we now take a look at a new type of physical quantity, the vector. A vector is a physical quantity that has both a magnitude that is a size and a direction. And what I mean by 
magnitude or size is that it has a number and some units like it could be five meters but it's obviously if it's the size of an object it can't be negative it has to be zero and onwards positive that's a scalar but on top of that it's more than that it tells you a direction so for instance if you want to drive from one place to another it's not enough to say that you need to drive 20 miles you have to drive in the right direction or you won't get where you want to go many quantities in physics are vectors examples are position displacement velocity force torque linear momentum electric fields and many more angular momentum magnetic fields the list goes on and on and on about 70 percent of everything in physics is some sort of a vector now scalars are important too time energy so forth if you don't know what these particular terms are that's okay we're going to cover them through the semester but the point is is that when you see these terms you have to apply vector math to work the problems not scalar math and vector math is different to represent something in an equation in the book and to tell you that they're talking about vectors the book needs to be able to communicate this and it does it by putting an arrow over a quantity some books will put it slightly different they'll put an arrow that's more like this I prefer kind of the one they'll have both older books back when all they had were typewriters couldn't put that arrow over so what they would do is if they were doing a scalar they'd do it like this but if they were doing a vector they would bold it so bold not regular text they use bold the math of a vector is different than a scalar so it's important when you look at an equation that you figure out what it's trying to tell you now one of the things that you can get a lot of information for with vectors is by using the graphical representation that is representing these things as arrows in order to understand how they add how they multiply and so forth so let's look at that the way we're going to do this graphically is that we're going to describe this vector by an arrow whose length gives the magnitude of the vector and which points in the vectors direction and this can be done in three dimensions as well as two although it gets harder obviously depending on how good a drawer you are as to how well you can do this so let me show you an example here's say an X and a Y and I would come up here and I would draw a vector whose length corresponds to whatever the quantity is so if the quantity was 5 then that length of that vector would be bigger than another vector for instance whose length is 1 I'll show you that in just a second so for instance this might be this vector it obviously is going to have some angle maybe that angle is 20 degrees and I have to make sure it points at 20 degrees and it has some length here that length might be 7 meters and that's the vector that arrow another vector might be over here and that vector might only be one meter so it's only should be only one seventh as long as this is and that vector appears to be in a different direction it's 90 degrees with respect to the x-axis you have to give both the length and the direction and if you're drawing arrows you draw them to scale you get a ruler and you measure that length and you use a protractor to put down the angles now of course the book might want to tell you to draw something so they have to have a way of doing that and uh, they do it's called the polar form 
that they can tell you. Uh, I might say before we go any further that uh, you have to be a little bit uh, careful about our definition. Our definition of a vector is as good as we need for this course. However, in advanced courses, you'll find that there are other things that also have links and directions, and they don't obey the mathematics of vectors. Okay? There are more than just vectors and scalars in the world. So consequently, the way mathematicians go about it and the way physicists and engineers advance courses is that they will say that there's a set of operations like addition, multiplication, rotation, and that these objects have to obey these operations, one of which is if you rotate a vector, its length can't change. <clears throat> so just having a magnitude and direction turns out in advanced courses is not enough to uniquely define a vector. All right, so there are more advanced definitions, but you'd be surprised how far along, very, very, very far in your coursework you can get by if you can observe and think of the vector as being an arrow whose length corresponds to its magnitude and who points in the direction that it's going.